Some say food is hyper palatable. Some say sugar is addictive. Some say low calorie sweeteners cause weight gain. The problem with the term hyper palatable or bliss point or any of these terms used in many books is that they have no scientific meaning or quantification. In this show, we will delve hardcore into the science of macronutrients and their neural responses. Let's find out. Welcome to the Keto Geek Podcast. Let's do this. Health, nutrition, fitness, low carb lifestyle. Welcome to the Keto Geek Podcast. My name is Corey. I'm known as the alchemist here at Keto Geek, and I'm joined by the one and only Fahad. Oh man, it feels weird. It feels interestingly weird. And Corey, what an intro, my man. Oh, I thank you. It's kind of fun to flip it around, isn't it, Fahad? Damn, you owned it, my friend. But yeah, um, everybody else. Oh man, we got a people. We got people over here. People, welcome to our podcast. This time, Corey, you were missing. People probably were missing you last time. I know. I was a little bummed out that I had to miss out on that one. Life is busy. I hope you guys understand. I know Fahad freaking killed it for you guys last time. So we're back together and we are so excited to bring you this new podcast. And this is the third part of our journey. Third and the final part. I wouldn't say it's the end of the journey per se, but at least on this series, this is going to be a really good podcast. You saw the notes. What do you think, man? I think this podcast is going to be an apps. I'm going to be very transparent. It's going to be a fire hose of knowledge, but so many gems in here. We're yeah. going to mine them out today for you. And I really hope you enjoy this ride with us. Yeah, just sit back and chill out. But first, we need to we need to tell everybody who we are, because, you know, we are sponsored by ourselves at the moment. And uh we are Keto Geek, and we make different products. One of them is ghee. What is ghee, man? Ghee? If you haven't heard, it's clarified butter. It's like butter, but purified essence. Pure, strong, punchy flavors. A little warm, a little toasty, a little nutty. Go buy a jar. Go check it out. We have 12-ounce jars for sale on the website. And there are some interesting dishes you can make with ghee. I know you can saute with them. You can make some oriental dishes. I know I'm from Pakistan, from the South Asia region, and we make a lot of delicious food. So if you're in for something exotic, something warm and tasty, go get that ghee. Go to our website, ketogeek.com. But, but my friend, there's one more product, which is the cornerstone, the heart of Keto Geek. What is it called, man? Oh, the energy pods. And guess what is in those energy pods? We have ghee. The very ghee that we make in-house. We have MCT oils. It's sugar-free. There's a little protein. It's just the best ingredients we can actually find. And how's the chocolate fudge coming along, Fahad? I know you've actually been taking a wheel in the kitchen. Let's hear a little bit more about from you. Oh, man. Before I even get into the Chocolate Fudge Energy Pod, first, I want to thank everybody who ordered it on the launch date. You guys, more power to you. You guys are the reason why this podcast even exists. Thank you so much. And everybody who's getting the knowledge out there, everybody who's supporting us, guys, these people who are buying our product, they're the ones who are keeping, keeping us alive. You guys are amazing. So thank you so much. And as far as the Chocolate Fudge Energy Pod is concerned, it's going great. We are finally on Amazon. We're not on Amazon Prime yet, but you can still order it from Amazon. We hand ship it ourselves, even when you do order it from there. And there are some modifications, like the latest batch. It has a little bit more protein. It has a little bit more sweetness. And it is a little bit more shelf stable. The texture is also improved quite a bit. Uh, I think you've tried the new version. What do you think about that? I have to agree with you on all those points. Uh, and actually, the chocolate is coming through so beautifully. We're using a, a much nicer chocolate, actually, this time around in Keto Geek. We want to give you guys the absolute best. And I find that it's just overall an upgrade. Energy Pod 2.0. And I would say that this is artisan style because every batch is unique 
and different because is it is literally we make it from scratch we process it our, ourselves and when we were making the ghee that we mentioned earlier that was something that we were not happy about when we started making our product have you tried some of the other ghees they're so strong they're so aromatic right. they didn't have that sort of bakery friendly aroma and taste to it but man we've i think we've kind of nailed it and it's 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 amazing and everybody who's tasted it they love it and the, you can also subscribe to a box every month which i think is the best way to do it just set it and forget it go to the ketogeek.com website go to the shop section and then go straight into the energy pods pick your flavor right now chocolates in stock subscribe and save click on that add to cart and boom now you're gonna have one box every month and you will not regret it there are so many people out there who are doing that and have it delivered monthly it supports a great cause this podcast that you love and above all we continue this journey of science which you guys are about to find out and this today's episode like it's like we were saying we're all excited about it we're wrapping up a huge topic some of the most controversial things that we've talked about it's kind of crazy and Corey, so you weren't here last week but up till now this whole journey in a very short summary what do you think man i think so far it's been an absolutely amazing journey uh our knowledge base is building we decided to uh keep an open mind when keto geek actually began keto was the catalyst and it really got us into the health sphere it really boosted our uh interest in nutritional science and which we both agree is uh, needs a little bit more help but this paper right here just full of gems like unbelievable and we've uncovered so much that has actually broken what we thought was an honest truth oh yeah and the paper's name is the macronutrients appetite and energy T intake once again it is by dr richard d mattis and his crew at purdue university all credit goes to them what we're do doing here is just taking the entire paper paraphrasing it condensing it and uh, making it more simple for people to understand that's all we're doing in this way we can carry and and produce these gems for you guys but there's two things we need to be wary people need to be wary of when they listen to this entire show what is it Corey? well one this is very science heavy we're talking phd levels of knowledge being worked into this paper here but it gets to what is going on here and if you don't understand everything completely that's okay there are just some simple gold nuggets that you can extract from this, and we've highlighted that in the podcast. And secondly, pardon our pronunciation, as we are just readers and not somebody who took many years of schooling to become a biochemist or a doctor as a major. You can, you can and should laugh at our pronunciation and welcome to comment on how bad or good that we do. Yep. And with that being said, and put aside, all disclaimers added, our product in the line, all the constellations checked out, it's time to do this. Let's go. All right, Fahad, we're going to kick this thing off. I'm about to hand you the reins to this thing. I'm going to hand you the whole nine yards. I want you to fire every single bullet. I know you uh, folks are going to be like, holy moly, this is a lot of information. That's okay. Just sit back, relax, get your favorite food, get an energy pod, and yeah. enjoy the show. Yeah, get the energy pod. Anyway, let us begin the journey. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the neural response to carbohydrates. And I'm going to start reading from our notes and paraphrase and accordingly go along as well. So the role of carbohydrates in energy balance has transitioned from being the macronutrient to be emphasized for weight management to a more neural one to the present where they are often regarded as especially problematic and as you guys already know we've dealt with the metabolic response we've gone through the endocrine response so now we're on the final final nine yards as you would say Corey. i guess <laughs> <laughs> well, a question side note totally off topic what does what does nine yard actually mean Oh, the whole nine yards. Uh, well, this kind of subs this comes from World War II, and back when they had reams of bullets, they had fifty caliber machine guns and bombers, and 
the nine yards refers to how long that belt is. It's nine yards of 50 caliber machine gun bullets. Oh, man. One day we should talk about the history, man. All these historical things. Perhaps maybe not on Keto Geek Podcast, but anyway, let us backtrack. So going back to the carbohydrates, this issue with par- particularly with carbohydrates is true for refined carbohydrates which has some content st- stimulate appetite and activate brain reward systems leading to addictive ingestion behaviors that promote positive energy balance however the veracity of this view is not established reports on food addiction rarely specify the active component, but refer to high-sugar, high-fat, energy-dense, highly processed foods. And we get to hear that all the time, don't we? We do. But given the lack of a, of a widely agreed-upon definition of processed and disagreements over how to calculate energy density, this definition is left wanting. And we literally did a podcast two episodes ago on processed food. You guys can totally check that out and you will understand what our point of view is because we've covered really deeply into it. Interestingly, the degree of processing is often highlighted as it reportedly reflects the rate of nutrient absorption, which is kind of true. However, it is unclear how sugar and fat are concurrently implicated as they have markedly different rates of gastric emptying and absorption into the circulation. So they're both very different in that regards. High palatability is another attribute linked to addiction with opposing claims that foods have been formulated to be quote unquote hyper palatable and that highly processed foods have lost the sensory appeal they had when natural quote unquote. And these are terms we've already addressed in the past as well. But let's go back to um, over here on our paper. But Corey, I mean, what's what's your stance on the whole natural and the whole hyper palatable? I know that you're also going to be going through some changes in how you think after this paper. Yeah, absolutely. So when I think hyper palatable, I think of something that is just almost impossible to put down. Uh, my favorite childhood snack was uh, the Twinkies, for example, and many would regard those as a hyper palatable snack. And they kind of, in a sense, uh, Twinkies, they can, uh, of course, like overpower and override what is uh, quote unquote natural foods. Um, but I don't feel like I can eat a lot of Twinkies, man. I no. just can't. No. So it, they just, they're, they're like, it hits the roof. It's just like, it's so sweet. I don't want any more than that. I'm just done. It's just too rich. So I'm okay with going back to having steak and eggs or uh, perhaps a Caesar salad or some cheese or something like that that has a little bit more of a low-key flavor that's a little bit more uh, not punch you in the face. But I wouldn't call it addicting. Yep, and we're going to delve a little bit further into the nitty-gritty of it. Very mechanical and technical as well. But going back to this definition of this hyperpalatable or natural, neither position has scientific standing because liking and preferences are learned attributes, as reflected by many distinct global cuisines and evidence that familiarity is a strong predictor of acceptability, as as seen with sugar, fat, and salt. And let's parse it down, because there are three studies referenced here, each regarding to sugar, fat, and salt. And that's a popular book, I believe, that a lot of people have... Uh, read, especially in our nutrition world, the whole salt, fat, sugar thing. But let's look at what the evidence is saying. When it comes to sugar, in one study about uh, of about 59 6 to 11 year old children and 46 young adults of average 22 years received various sweet tasting orangeades and sour tasting orangeades and no orangeades. So there was three different kinds of test groups over here with each intervention. Sweet and sour by the end were both equally preferred at baseline, but after eight-day exposure, the children consuming the sweet orangeade preferred the sweet orangeade, while the sour and control groups did not show any preferential difference. All of this had no effect on the adults. So notice, Corey, it's only affecting the children and not the adults. And the people who were consuming the sweet orangeade were consuming more sweet orangeade. They were preferring it more. So... It goes to show that there is something going on over here. However, adults, no difference. Weird. So it's kind of inconclusive. 
when it comes to fat in a study health, healthy adults were assigned to a reduced fat diet and a similar diet that allowed fat modified products or no dietary modification sort of like a control group observations in this study were made monthly for 12 weeks of adherence and 12 weeks of follow-up Reduction of fat intake was achieved in experimental groups and hedonic or pleasantness rating for high fat foods and preference for fat content of selected foods declined, but only in groups deprived of sensory exposures to fats. Interesting. It was concluded that the frequency of sensory exposures to fat, meaning the amount of times you were exposed to fat, exerts stronger influence of, on the pleasantness or hedonic ratings of food containing fat then the total fat intake. So exposure was more important than the amount over here. Okay, because they used different kinds of fats. Some of them had fat in them. Some of them had um, a substitution of some sort in the fats, like a reduced fat sort of group. Um, hedonic shifts may promote long-term compliance with reduced fat diet. So that's what they were saying. It's like, what if we were to remove the fat and create reduced fat products? That's why, why a lot of uh, products use this sort of methodology anyway when it comes to salt which is the third one we were talking about two experiments were conducted in this study in one experiment one group of subjects added salt to food for four weeks and the second group ingested salt tablets for the same period the third group was given a placebo sodium excretion increased in all groups but the concentration of salt in soup rated as tasting as most pleasant increased only in the group that added salt to their food not the tablet people rated intensity of salt did not change okay that happened <laughs> in the second experiment salt supplementation was extended to six weeks so this was a longer trial and taste function was tested more extensively at the end concentrations of salt in soup rated as tasting most pleasant increased in group once again which added salt to their food this group which added salt to their food also added more salt to soup to taste than did the salt tablet group so it's like they're evolving their tastes are changing based on the exposure level mm -hmm. so it's adaptations happening here hence preferred concentration of salt can be increased after dietary salt supplementation and increased salt taste stimulation probably required this to occur so this is interesting sweetness let's talk about sweetness so sweetness is another often cited dimension of addictive foods studies with mice indicate tasting sugar without digestion stimulates dopamine release mm. if sweetness is effective is the effective signal then addiction would be expected for low calorie sweeteners as well because we're talking about sweetness not the sugar not this caloric component component however in humans it was also noticed that dopamine release is greater for sucrose which is table sugar compared to the low calorie sweetener solutions so it was slightly lower however some studies on diet soda consumers show similar activation of brain reward system when consuming sucrose and saccharin sweetened beverages saccharin is a low calorie sweetener and a significantly greater dopaminergic response compared to non-diet soda drinkers so non-diet soda drinkers meaning they could be drinking anything like for example water that's what they mean over here. So there is a dopamine component, seemingly, with, with sugar and saccharin, uh, table sugar and saccharin. One explanation holds that the regular use of low-calorie sweeteners decreases the response of reward centers to sucrose and thereby leads to increased ingestion. Whether res reduced responsivity, if it occurs, leads to greater intake as a means to achieve a desired level of stimulation or lower intake due to a lower reward value is an open question. The two largest meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials indicate low calorie sweeteners were associated with lower body mass index. And this has been supported by a more recent randomized controlled trial. And this randomized controlled trial was conducted in 2015, used 303 weight stable overweight or obese individuals who consumed 24 ounces of water or non-nutritive sweetener for one year. 
Non-nutritive sweetener group showed greater weight loss at the end of one year with 6.21 kilogram loss compared to 2.45 group kilogram for the water group. So the science is supportive that these sweetener, uh, low calorie sweetener beverages can be effective compared to water. Another challenge to the view that sweetness is the driver of addictive feeding stems from work with TRPM, five mice lacking the ability to taste sweetness. These mice significantly prefer a sucrose table sugar over a sucralose or a non-nutritive sweetener solution and have significantly increased activation of the dopaminergic <laughs> dopaminergic system, indicating that post-ingestive energy contribution of sugar may be the primary driver of reward center activity. So now they're focusing, what if it's the energy com component rather than the sweetness component that could have the influence there? Other work indicates low-calorie sweeteners activate the opioid system responsible for liking, but that nutritive sweeteners activate dopamine pathways responsible for working to attain those substances. There's a difference over here, liking and working towards attaining that substance. Those are two different things. These findings raise questions about the hypothesis that sweetness, as provided by low-calorie sweetness sweeteners, is addictive because the motivation to attain that substance, not just liking it, is a necessary component of addiction. Measurements issue ha uh, measurement issues hamper study of sweetness and addiction. The Yale Food Addiction Scale, based on the DSM for drug abuse diagnostic tools, is the most widely used criteria to classify individuals as food addicted. However, the reliability of the scale has not been established. Further, much of the literature on this issue draws on measurements of dopamine in rodents. Some evidence indicates that the taste of sugar elicits the release of dopamine dose dependently. However, dopamine may be released in the absence of a rewarding stimulus and may also remain unchanged in the presence of a rewarding stimulus. Crazy, right? It is, yeah. Do you, have, do you have anything to add over here, or do you want me to just continue firing? I think we just need to continue firing. This is interesting. Yeah, this is crazy stuff. Additionally, the amount of dopamine released depends on the novelty of the food and decreases after repeated exposure to the same food, in contrast to drugs abuse, which elicit continued dopamine release. So there's a difference right here between food and drugs. Absolute major difference. There. Yep. I wouldn't and have expected that. Exactly. This is something that people fail to sort of differentiate here because they think, oh, foods are addictive. No, 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 no. There's a difference here. <laughs> we're, we're defining it wrong. There's different reactions. There's, there's, there's a different pathway. All of these things are just different. But very interesting stuff here, man. Mm -hmm. The absolute magnitude of reward system response to sugar is also markedly smaller compared to the drugs of abuse. Thus, the dopaminergic—I'm <laughs> gonna screw up this all the time. Thus, the dopaminergic system is an imperfect index of reward system activation and addiction. In light of the limited support for addiction to any one good, some have suggested framing the issue as an eating addiction instead of a food addiction. In other words, it would be an addiction to the to the act of eating rather than the addiction to one specific food. You know, like diminishing reward from one food, it, it, it just kind of doesn't make any sense. Mm. And, and I think everybody can testify to it. Like if you eat the same thing over and over again, by like week seven or eight, you're probably not going to like it as much or right. may even resent it. It's just what I said earlier in the podcast. Those Twinkies are just going to probably taste more bland over time. And I won't really get any hit from the Twinkie anymore, but... Drugs seem to have a, a much different uh, effect on the uh, dopaminergic, dopamin, laugh at me, dopaminergic system. Got it. <laughs> Dude, we, we like massacre biology on this show. I hope every PhD is laughing at us today. Dude, just like the witcher is the butcher of Blaviken, we're the butchers of biochemistry. <laughs> 
<laughs> we don't want your kind here, Witcher. <laughs> we were like, who's the Witcher? Just Google it up. We're like super nerds. Go watch it. It's, it's going to come up on December. We're all going to watch it together. Season two on Netflix. Oh, man. It. It's like the greatest show on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's go back, man. Um, this all would be in line with the recent recognition that other behavioral addictions such as computer gaming, you know, it's kind of like when you, it's interesting how they refer this to computer gaming because it makes sense because you're not playing the same level, same way, same everything at the at every, every single round. When you're like, let's say playing a video game, you're trying to say, Hey, how can I do this differently to increase the reward value, get more points. So there's consistently changing stuff going on with video games. So it's not the addiction with the same level, same game, same, same thing. It's, it's not the same thing at all over here. That's a pursuit of variety, it seems. Pursuit of variety and a pursuit for a higher reward. So there's a lot of stuff going on in there. And you cannot say that one food is addictive. It's, it's an, it could be an eating addiction rather than a food addiction. Anyway, however, the question remains as to whether addiction or some other descriptor such as disorder is more apt. So we don't know yet. Finally, the putative implication of sweet food addictions are not clear. A primary basis for concern about sugar addiction is a posited link to increased energy intake and weight gain. Here's the problem, though. Surveys reveal only about 5% of the population, 3% of males and 6.7% of females, would be classified as food addicted. Also, a meta-analysis determined the prevalence of food addiction as 11.1% of the normal weight population from six included studies compared with 24.9% of the overweight obese population for, with, from 14 included studies. Here's the kicker. However, given the prevalence of overweight and obesity is about 68% of the population in the United States which is higher now, by the way, this paper was 2016, and now it's like 2021, this trait could not be ascribed to a major role in the etiology of this pervasive problem. And it makes sense. How can you have 70% of the population just addicted to food, addicted to Southern food, you know? So that just doesn't make sense. These numbers don't add up. Oh, man, it's crazy. It is wild. <laughs> Um, others have narrowed the argument to focus on individuals with binge eating disorder. Several rat models have implicated sugar addiction in the context of binge eating disorder. However, in humans, it is possible to have a binge eating disorder and not be food addicted, according to current classification methods. And those classified as addicted may not have binge eating disorder. So there's a contradiction right there. Thus, binge eating disorder lacks sensitivity and a spe specificity as a marker. Addictive behavior does not fit the two popular models of weight gain in the population. So there's problems. Why? I mean, everybody can't be just a binger, you know? 70% of the population is just a binger. Uh, doesn't make sense. A small systematic positive energy balance does not follow from the expected more gluttonous intake pattern by addicted individuals in an environment where energy is readily available. Alternatively, if weight gain stems from periodic or holiday-style eating, this suggests the addictive traits manifest only episodically rather than being a stable trait of an individual. Oh, man. People gaining weight on Christmas and then sort of losing it, eat, eating more during certain times of the year. Like, it's just so contradictory. Mm -hmm. So, taken together, the recent demonization of sugar as a driver of addictive, specifically addictive, they're not saying metabolic or anything. We're talking about addiction. So, taken together, the recent demonization of sugar as a driver of addictive eating behaviors that promote obesity requires resolution of many outstanding issues, as were discussed previously. Among these are what the offending agent actually is. Is it the sweetener? Is it the sweetness? Is it the palatability? How to reliably and accurately measure and quantify these responses to a stimuli, intra and inter-individual variability, insusceptibility, and health implications. All right, Corey. So now that we've done this section, what do you what do you think about what do we, what do you think about this? 
So what I'm pulling from this is that this these findings seem to be pointing at an opposite direction of food addiction and more in the direction of eating addiction. And I think it's catalyzed by the fact that we have a very high access to a stupid amount of uh, foods and energy out there. And because of that variety, we can continually reset uh, our taste buds as we eat food. And we're not getting, or if you tried to eat the same food over and over again, you're going to get tired of it. But what we're seeing here is the act of eating and it's switching from chips. It's switching over to ice cream. It's switching over to a hamburger throughout the day. Try to eat three hamburgers in your day. Your one, two, three meal is a hamburger. You're probably going to eat a quarter hamburger on the third meal. Why would you want to eat three hamburgers when you can eat uh, a milkshake and you can have other uh, crunchy foods and different textures and just to mix it up. But this is what I'm kind of deriving uh, right now on a high level from this uh, paper so far. And Corey, one thing that I would like to also point out over here now that we're a little bit more educated on this topic is, okay, so we're talking about reward value, but nowadays it seems that a lot of health communities are focused on you know what we were talking about, how the most disgusting food is considered the most tastiest? I don't know if that's the greatest approach to this problem. Because let's say if episodic eating is a problem, then what you're doing with lower reward foods, like for example, kale, is that you're just simply uh, going to binge on foods when you get access to the tasty foods. But we know that if your diet is filled of just tasty foods, you're going to adapt to it. So the problem isn't the reward value per se on its own. Perhaps the problem is that we, one of the problems, not the entire problem, is that we're focusing on the wrong side of the equation. We're focusing on disgusting being healthy <laughs> when we know that tasty can be adapted as well. And so you're going to go out there and eat the salad, but you're more than likely going to compensate with something tastier later. Exactly. The late night binges. Oh, Yes. The Ben and Jerry's trips at no night. No stranger to that. Exactly. All day you're eating salad, and what happens at night? You're going to go for the highest reward foods. That's right. But if your diet is composed of high reward foods as is, there's a high chance, there's probably a good chance that you're not going to crave even a higher reward, unless you're going to shoot up drug or, drugs or something. <laughs> so just this is really interesting to point out, and my thoughts are that our method of using very low reward foods to combat this problem may not be the problem here, may not be the best solution here. And I, I see that in the health communities. It becomes a projection of my demons onto you rather than, hey, let's find out what works and what's tasty and what's sustainable. And this is a big haunting ghost in the nutrition sphere. A lot of uh, dietary interventions that you see, they work for a period of time, whether it's low carb, whether it's keto, whether it's vegan, whether it's whatever diet it is, it works. For a period of time, but when people go back to those tastier foods or higher reward foods, the game's over, and they just start binging on food. It's kind of crazy. You got anything else to add, Corey? Before we move on to the protein? Nope, I do not have anything further to add. I think we can just keep trucking along. All right, I'll bring the truck, the UPS truck, <laughs> waiting for a delivery today. Anyway. So the neural response to protein. So when we were talking about the metabolic response, we we're talking about the immunostatic model. Now, this is a very different uh, version of this. It, it has more relationship to the brain. And so amino acids are precursors for transmitters in serotonergic, dopaminergic, and opioid brain reward pathways. Please don't mind me as I continue to butcher these terms. Um, so these are three different pathways that we're going to talk about. And just to give a little bit of a basic overview, serotonergic pathway pertains to serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter that modulates food, cognition, reward, learning, memory, and various physiological functions. Dopaminergic pertains to dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that in practicality modulates desirability or aversiveness of an outcome, which brings the organism toward or against that outcome. Interesting definition, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Opioid, which is the third one, refers to the opioids that can be simply thought of as powerful class of drugs that act on the brain to provide pain relief, but may also possess addictive properties. 
the morphine. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the serotonergic pathway. And in this constant context, in this context, the serotonergic system also contributes to the hedonic or pleasurable sensations of food and satiation more than to the sensation of hunger. The rate of serotonin synthesis is limited by tryptophan availability as tryptophan is the precursor molecule to serotonin. And what exactly is tryptophan? Tryptophan is an amino acid that is used in the biosynthesis of proteins and is obtained only from diet because our body cannot produce it. So these are precursors to serotonin. Though proteins may be rich in tryptophan, its availability, on the other hand, in the brain is determined by the plasma ratio of tryptophan to other large neutral amino acids as they all compete for uptake across the blood-brain barrier. Dietary carbohydrates enhance tryptophan uptake in the brain by stimulating insulin secretion, which enhances absorption of amino acids competing for access to the transporter into the skeletal muscle. In addition, insulin promotes the uptake of free fatty acids into adipocytes or fat storage cells, allowing unbound albumin. Is that how you pronounce it? Albumin? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not a PhD man. All right, albumin. <laughs> a prominent protein found in the blood to bind with tryptophan, hence preventing its uptake by peripheral tissues. Intake of tryptophan-rich foods reportedly reduces the preference for sweet foods in individuals with high anxiety. There was a study on that. However, other studies have not demonstrated such effects. For example... The reference study here is a double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study. Very powerful, my friend. It was conducted among 18 healthy males in which one group was given an alpha lacto lact lacto lactobumin lact albumin <laughs> alongside carbohydrates, and others were given carbohydrates only. Appetite. Food intake, macronutrient preference, or mood didn't change despite the increase noted in the ratio, the ratio we were talking about, ratio of tryptophan to the sum of large neutral amino acids. It was supposed to make a difference. They were the chosen ones. Hence, just because a mechanism exists over here in this study, as we can note, doesn't mean that it is impactful. Looking at you, autophagy and fasting. Uh, bro. <laughs> it's, it's like the lowest hanging fruit of, of, uh, of the health and nutrition world fasting. It's, it's literally the easiest thing you can do, though. You just stop eating. And of <laughs> course, everybody wants to hang on to that. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, God. Anyway, although diets can influence tryptophan availability, the importance of this pathway is uncertain since the brain maintains a pool of serotonin to cover needs between meals. Well then, the more you know. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, man. All right, let's, let's move on to the, the, the second pathway, the dopamine, dopaminergic pathway. The dopaminergic pathway is involved in food-based reward as well and is most closely linked to hunger. The synthesis of dopamine, like the previous one, is dependent on its amino acid precursor, tyrosine and phenylalanine. So tyrosine or L-tyrosine generally is a non-essential amino acid that is used by cells to synthesize proteins. It is produced in the body from phenylalanine. Now the question is, let's move on. What's, what's phenylalanine? like tangential learning going on over here. <laughs> Phenylalanine is an essential amino acid that is found in various foods such as milk, eggs, chicken, liver, beef, soybeans, and interestingly enough, here's the fun one, interestingly enough, from aspartame, which is an artificial sweetener that breaks down into phenylalanine as its metabolite. Hold up, isn't aspartame like bad for you, man? <laughs> no, what, just, what's going on? It just breaks down into amino acids. <laughs> And, and people have made like a huge big deal about it, how crazy like it's, it's responsible for the end of the universe, like the worse than the 2012 end of the world scenario. Like it's going to catalyze the heat death of the universe faster. <laughs> and, and all it does is aspartame breaks down into two amino acids, oh, two or three amino acids. I don't remember the exact name. so hit. fun. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but here's the important thing. Phenylalanine is not synthesized by our body and must be obtained from the diet. 
Similar to tryptophan in the last section in the serotonergic pathway, the availability of tyrosine in the brain is modifiable by diet and depends on the plasma concentration of its amino acid competitors. However, the influence of dietary protein on dopamine signaling is not well understood. In a recent study involving overweight, adolescent breakfast skippers, like me, a high-protein breakfast elicited a greater and sustained plasma homovanillic acid concentrations, which is an index of the brain's level of dopamine production, than a normal protein breakfast. While this may suggest that increased protein intake is rewarding, other work has not documented such effects. So there is the, it's very interesting. We thought that protein probably isn't rewarding, but there, are, there is a potential here. It's very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. Now let's move on to the third pathway, which is the opioid pathway. The opioid pathway is associated with motivational aspects of feeding. Opioid peptides can be formed from hydrolysis of dietary proteins in the GI tract. When absorbed, opioid opioid peptides can traverse the blood-brain barrier like the last one, where they produce opioid or drug-like effects. However, the functionality of this pathway with respect to human feeding is again not established. The early focus on dietary protein as a modulator of appetite by providing precursor amino acids for neurotransmitter synthesis was later augmented by documentation that dietary proteins elicit complex signals in the form of gut neuropeptides and hormones that converge on the brain via the vagus nerve and through the circulation. By the way, just as a friendly uh, reminder, the vagus nerve is basically the same one we talked about earlier, which uh, collects sensory cues for the body. These signals integrate with input from peripheral sensory systems, or the outer ones, to influence the neural contribution to energy balance. So we're trying to take the outside and bring it on the inside. Like, what's going on here, man? Inputs from neural circuits responsible for motivation, cognition, and hedonic impressions contribute further and guide food choices. The impact of dietary proteins on food cravings are not well characterized. Now, there's, here's another interesting one. The food cravings and protein. You, you hear that all, a lot of the times. However, it is, paradoxically, it is paradoxically thought to reduce reward-driven feeding behaviors despite being a precursor for neurotransmitters subserving reward pathways. Crazy, isn't it? At one point, it's, a, it's this precursor for something very rewarding, and now it's like, it's not that rewarding. What? 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 Crazy. Centrally, you had something to add? I do not. Let's move on. All right. So centrally, the satiating effect of dietary protein is largely mediated by the activation of neurons in the nucleus of the solitary tract, NTS. And the arcuate nucleus ARC of the hypothalamus just to put things very simply over here these are basically regions of the brain that take in sensory input from various parts of the body including the GI tract activation of the noradrenogenic and adrenogenic neurons in simplicity these are neurons or cells that the, in the brain that impact alertness arousal and readiness uh, so following the high protein intake can enhance satiety and decrease energy intake by increasing sensitivity to gut hormones such as cck or cholecystokinin as we can remember from our uh, last episode cck is purported to be basically a satiety hormone In addition, high-protein intake can decrease mRNA expression of vagal orexin-1 receptor, hence reversing the inhibitory effects of orexin on CCK-mediated satiety. Okay, that's that's a lot of words. Chunky. All right, very chunky. All right, let's 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 start to let's start to make it a little bit more simpler. So mRNA, just to for people who don't know, most people probably already know, are basically. Uh, messenger ribonucleic acid, and they are, it is a molecule that is used in the process of synthesizing proteins. To put it very simply, orexin-1 receptor, on the other hand, is simply a protein receptor involved in regulating feeding behavior, and orexin is a neuropeptide or brain protein that regulates arousal, wakefulness, and appetite and some very interesting side note that I found out during my research was that the most common form of narcolepsy, or type 1, is caused by the, the lack of this orexin 
that we talked about in the brain due to the destruction of the cells that produce it. Mm, so there are some interesting things going on here. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, in other words, just to kind of simplify all of this, high protein intake, hypothetically speaking, in a series of neural events, has the potential to create satiety. That's what they're saying here. High protein intake also upregulates the catabolic or breaking down of POMC pathway and downregulates the anabolic or constructing NPY AGRP pathway in the ARC. Um, leucine may be the principal amino acid modulating the satiety effects of the high protein diet. That's what they thought. Um, anyway, the hedonic properties of foods that guide selection and consumption are determined by interconnections between several regions of the brain, primarily in the orbitofrontal cortex, amygdala, insula, nucleus, accumbens, and dorsal striatum. Striatum? Striatum. striatum. Historically, sweet and fatty foods have been considered rewarding with limited consideration for protein. This may stem from the neutral or unpleasant taste of most amino acids and proteins. Some amino acids, peptides, such as aspartame, for example, and proteins, uh, monilin and thalbotine, are sweet, but these are not strongly preferred. So here's, what, here's what's the kicker over here. There are different kinds of amino acids. Some of them are also sweet, but for some reason, they're not as preferred. Crazy, right? So when somebody says that there is no sweet amino acids or sweet protein, no, dude, there are. Yep. Looks like it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so you can make those, uh, you can make those hyper palatable arguments, which literally make no sense. I mean, now that everybody's listening to this podcast, now you guys should realize w that the whole thing is just a buzzword and there's literally no scientific uh, quantification or value to that word. There's, there's no way, and people should realize that if you can't measure it, then it's just a buzzword. You've put, you may have put the hand on the problem, but you have no idea what exactly the problem entails. So when somebody says it's heavy, you don't know it's 50 kilograms or if it is two grams, you don't have any quantifications. That's very true. It's all subjective at that point. Yes. So hyperpalatable could technically just mean, you know, you're just making two tasty foods and my cooking sucks or my food suck. I don't know. <laughs> if you burn your food every single day and then you go eat at grandma's kitchen, of course, grandma's food's going to taste better. Yeah. Burnt food? No, that's really not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition, mice and humans avoid or negatively rate hydrolyzed casein in a dose dependent manner. That's interesting. Casein is the slow absorbing protein. In one randomized or randomized ordered double blind study, that's pretty powerful. 50 healthy volunteers, 50 is a big number. It's a pretty good number in nutrition. 50 healthy volunteers were given 12 different milks and were evaluated from best to worst when it comes to smell, taste, and texture. Soy and rice were considered best tasting, followed by whey and then mixed hydrolysates, and then casein was rated as the lowest. Palatability was hence dictated by the amount of bitter peptides in the drinks. Interesting, right? Uh, so, cool stuff. Even, now, protein's associated with umami, isn't it? Right. Ooh, it's a right. Tasty umami. When I think of the protein, I'm like, yeah, steak and eggs, man. Like, let's get some umami in the body. Uh, not sweet uh, peptides. That's so bizarre. But even weirder that... Uh, Palatability was hesitated by the amount of bitter peptides in the drinks. Yeah. How? Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. But let's move on to the, the umami tasting, L-glutamate. Even umami tasting, L-glutamate, is not preferred over sucrose when it, in the form of monosodium glutamate. Um, further, though they contribute approximately the same energy as carbohydrates, we're talking about protein, proteins hold less appeal based on their metabolism. TRPM knockout mice that lack sweet taste transduction mechanisms prefer glucose over sweet tasting amino acid L-serine. Very, very fascinating. Mm. So this study, which we just talked about, uh, study here in mice shows that glucose-specific preference can develop 
independently of taste quality or caloric load. Yeah, that <laughs> oh my is God. Just strange. Yeah. Something is way beyond uh, what we actually think here. The tongue having pleasurable sensations is just uh, a tiny portion of this. The story wasn't completely written by your tongue, man. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. Yeah, these are things that even we, when, when I came across, I was like, what, what, what? You have to reread that a couple times, honestly. Um, let's go to the next part. Magnetic resonance imaging studies in animals and humans provide evidence of suppression of regions associated with food motivation and reward after protein intake. Interesting. In rats, protein consumption is associated with a decrease in the blood oxygen level dependent or BOLD signal in the amygdala. Mm. BOLD is basically a method used in functional magnetic resonance imaging that is used to observe different areas of the brain or organs which may be active at a given time. Moreover, in overweight female adolescent breakfast skippers, high protein breakfasts lead to greater reductions in three hour post breakfast activation of insula and the middle prefrontal cortex and reductions in pre dinner activation of hippocampal and parahippocampal regions compared to normal protein breakfasts. So in other words, a lot of uh, brain regions pertaining to memory, learning, working memory, sensations, and various other tasks were reduced in the high-protein breakfast skippers compared to normal protein breakfast skippers. Now, this muddies the water further, doesn't it? It does. In addition, the reductions in activation of affirmation brain regions coincide with increased increases in perceived afternoon fullness and correlate with reductions in appetite. The protein status of an individual may influence brain reward responses to food cues as well. Healthy women with a low protein status had higher bold, which we talked about, the blood oxygen level dependent responses in the orbitofrontal, orbitofrontal cortex and stratum in response to food cues compared to those with a high protein status. Now, there's some evidence that there are some critique towards the bold system, like the lighting up the brain stuff, the fMRA, but right. that's a topic for another day. In the same study, women in a low protein state had a higher ad lib, -lib intake of protein following the intervention than those in a high protein state. This indicates that protein status may have implications for modulating reward-driven feeding behaviors. Interpretation of this type of data, however, requires caution as associations are not necessarily straightforward. That's a huge problem with this, all this neural stuff. There can be a confirmation bias that we were always looking for. Oh, yeah, protein's the winner all the time. So you could be like, protein, 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 protein. So you got to be ca cautious about the brain. Um, for example... Reduced activation in the hippocampal regions after a high-protein meal may affect changes in hippocampal-dependent learning and memory rather than decreased rewards. It could be a totally different thing. It doesn't even have to be the reward. Also note, the study that is cited here, despite the high-protein breakfast, as mentioned in the study, no difference in energy intake was noted by the end of the day. That's cool, isn't it? Even though they had less snacking that day as well. But the energy mm. intake remains still the same. So... Another note over here that I made was that the high protein breakfast is basically 35 grams of eggs and beef steak and eggs mm -hmm. <laughs> versus cereal, which has about 13 grams of protein in it. So the question then becomes like, does that, how influential is that? Like, I don't know. Right. That doesn't seem like a huge, huge difference of protein there, 13 versus 35. Yep. So these effects could be short term and may not play a bigger role in the longer picture. As we found out, the daily energy intake is the same. I'm not sure why the authors kind of skipped on this part. Hmm. on this paper but you know let's go let's roll with them for now the hippocampus is also involved in the cognitive regulation of feeding behaviors such as remembering when one last ate conditioned associations with food remembering the inter interoceptive sensory cues and how to act on them etc etc so there's a lot of other ma faceted roles that this could be playing and we might be on the wrong track we don't know in summary there is a proposed multifold role for protein in neural regulation of appetite and feeding, but the importance of that role has yet to be delineated. Guess we agree on that. 
Uh, effects may be the manifestations of orosensory properties of protein, protein-induced metabolic processes converging on a neural circuit, and central neural activity, which ultimately regulates feeding. High-protein foods have generally not been implicated in disordered eating. That's where something we can agree on. But there are some interesting critiques I have over here. However, they've made some very good points over here. Just like with the carbohydrate and the protein, there are issues. But, you know, Corey, we, we got something over here. So, yeah, uh, what, what do you think, man? What do I think? Uh, this is uh, very interesting stuff. I did not realize how big of a role that protein would have uh, turning on so many signals in the brain to regulate uh, feeding, to regulate how the brain remembers when you ate last. And that is just so interesting. And now I'm, I'm really privy to look at uh, extremely low protein feeds versus extremely high protein feeds and get some MRIs on that and just see how the brain lights up. And it's just all very, very interesting to me now. Exactly. But at the same time, notice how they're saying you should proceed with caution on this matter. Right. Exactly. Because you could be thinking, oh, maybe it's because a protein is affecting learning and, uh, you know, right. ex certain executive functions, but maybe it's not the reward or maybe it's the reward, but maybe not the executive. So there's so many confounders here. Uh, I would personally, I would say metabolic has the highest predictability and then followed by potentially the endocrine and then potentially the brain comes in the last. That's what where I'm sort of seeing this as an overview. Perhaps maybe I'm wrong, but this is where I'm getting over here. Now the question is, Corey, interestingly enough, what dictates the metabolic? What concept does? Do you remember what I'm, what I'm referring to? It's the food structure. That's right. Food structure. It's where the story begins. And where it all ends. Well, it ends everywhere, but... Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, like but I mean, it sounds more epic when you say, this is where the story ends and begins. This is the alpha begins and, ends. and the omega. <laughs> <laughs> Where's that from? Alpha Omega? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Where is that from? I can't remember. It was a TV show that I stole that from. Perhaps uh, Dexter. Okay. I was thinking more in terms of Dark Side with his omega, omega beams. Oh, yeah, that is super nerdy. Dark Side. <laughs> Dark Side. <laughs> oh, man. Snyder Cut was a good... That was a good one. I need to hop on that still. One, one day, one day. When you have four and a half hours. When I have four and a half hours in my life, yes. What people need to do is go buy some energy pods so that you have a little bit more free time to watch these movies. You know, that's, that's a good idea. I can skip my meal and just eat energy pods and watch the Snyder Cut. I like oh, that. man. I sort of sidetracked, segueing a little bit over here. The other day, we posted a picture on Instagram, and I had the chocolate fudge energy pod. Not the chocolate, the, the strawberry prototype. And I added some white chocolate to it. And then I added a protein glaze on it, like a pure protein glaze. That was a very interesting experiment. Um, so more information on that new flavor is going to be out pretty soon. But it's turning out to be really good. Yeah, and if you're already following Keto Geek, make sure you do catch those stories because we're not just posting those straight up into the uh, gallery feed sometimes. And it's only just like a quip. And if you missed it, you missed it. But yeah, I saw that on the story because I do follow Keto Geek. And what's interesting is all of this stuff that we're talking over here, we're actually in, in, absorbing it and trying to apply it into a product. Like the new version of the Chocolate Fudge Energy Pod, it has a bit more protein. It has certain additives as well that are purported to be more satiating and filling. And just to go back on that protein uh, uh, strawberry energy pod that I had, dude, I remember I t texted you literally the next day and I said, bro, I've lost my hunger. Yeah. <laughs> and it got me thinking, I need to have one of these now and a full one at that. Yeah. So there's something to it. There's something to it. And we're going to delve a little bit more into it, even just to give everybody a bit of a heads up. Even now with knowing this and a lot more, we still are on a journey and we don't know every single thing. But we have a very good idea and certain prospective solutions to the obesity pandemic. Like you guys know, we go hardcore. So we'll, we're on to it. But I think we've kind of segued a lot. We should go back to the topic on hand. And speaking of fat, we should talk about fat. <laughs> yes, the neural responses to fat. The neural responses to the fat. <laughs> I don't know where that's from. I have no idea either. You should be a voice actor, my friend. Yes. Answer me, hobbits. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to put that part on the podcast. <laughs> anyway, 
Work conducted 50 years ago demonstrated that rodents prefer diets containing lard or petroleum jelly over standard rat chow. Does the, does petroleum jelly sound like something you would use on your bre- breakfast? No, uh, I try to protect my skin with it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, just to be non-chemophobic, I would say that I don't know what petroleum jelly per se entails and what how your body's going to respond to it. Right. So, but... From the looks of it, it doesn't sound pretty appetizing. Just, no. just, to, just give me the butter or the, ghee. But the rats enjoy. Yeah, go buy some ghee too while you're at it. While you're putting, while you're on the add to cart function on our website, just add ghee alongside, and enjoy the ride. Enjoy the tasty fats. So, but it's interesting how the the rodents prefer larger petroleum jelly over their standard rat show. <laughs> Oh, man. Subsequent studies confirmed that both high energy yield and sensory qualities such as taste, texture and smell are characteristics that render fat high, highly palatable and contribute to preference for and intake of high fat foods. An important role for fat properties in particular has been documented in rodents by trials showing a sham fed rats fed corn oil over mineral oil. B, rats preferred non-esterified or free or pre-digested fatty acids to triacylglycerol. And C, rats preferred triacylglycerol to triacylglycerol plus a lipase inhibitor, which blocks the digestion of fat, basically slows it down. Uh, uh, So that's the that's the interesting thing. Like we're moving from a level from so you could you could literally think of it as more closer to pre-digested fats the more uh, it's similar to that you'd find in your intestines, and I'm putting it very vaguely mm-hmm. here, the more closer to that form is more preferred compared to the lesser, sort of a higher level, less digested version of that fat. That's what they're noting over here. The, this hedonic taste response in rodents stands in sharp contrast to human responses, which are typically aversive to pure fat. Mm-hmm. When was the last time you chugged in olive oil, my friend? Never, ever, ever, ever. It just makes me want to puke thinking about that. So it, it didn't make sense in the humans when it comes to chugging down fat. No. We, we treat fat a little bit more differently. We get nauseated. So that's one thing. That's another point over here that just because something happens in rodents doesn't mean it's going to happen in you. Right. Um, however, as is the case with most bitter compounds, sampling non-esterified fatty acid in isolation and at high concentrations generally elicits an aversive response, while in low concentrations and in certain contexts, they may augment palatability in humans just as bitter notes contribute positively to flavor profile of foods such as chocolate, coffee, and wine. I don't know, man. I've never thought of wine as tasty per se. Is that you're? We're in the wine industry, and you're more exposed. I have a very interesting question over there. Do you think people really in, start enjoying taste of wine over time? This is like purely anecdotal, of course. I think over time is uh, absolutely correct. Um, today, I like wine. I like to drink it, and I like to have it maybe once a week. And I live and work in Napa Valley um, as a concierge to be a little transparent for you. So I do go around and taste at many wineries and uh, have found that it has taken time to like certain types of wines. But most people will start off with something that's a little bit more friendly and more neutral, such as white wine versus uh, red wine, which tends to be a lot more tannic, a lot more acidic and complex. The white wine uh, has been lovingly referred to as pork pounders here in Napa. Oh, man. See, this is something I, I, I don't know. I live in the bubble of the health and nutrition world. It's like, wine? Huh? Is that red? Is that white? Oh, yeah. Red wine. I love red wine. And then I end up saying things like, oh, this has less... Ta- I, I, I have come to recognize some properties of wine, to be fair. Like, I know when there's tannins in there, or when it's just a smooth, full-bodied wine. I've, I've become a little bit more Napa. Right. Uh, I have to say to everybody who's listening over here, Corey has worn all hats within Napa City. And one of the things that you need to see in in Napa is Corey himself. That's one of the travel destinations or travel (laughs) things to do in Napa. Drink wine, eat tasty food, find Corey like you would find Waldo. Exactly. And we're going to kick it. We're going to have wine, good food. We're going to go on hikes. It's going to be a great time. Yep. (laughs) 
Corey is the third most important thing to do to meet or look at or find in Napa. That's what I think. Anyway, That's what I saw on TripAdvisor. <laughs> Somebody posts a review and says that. That would be funny. Oh, man. Uh, so n- let's go back here. No evidence for flavor enhancement currently exists, whereas avoidance of foods such as uh, f- avoidance of foods with high concentrations of non-esterified fatty acids, such as rancid foods, is well recognized in humans. Nobody likes rancid food, man. Mm-mm. Other work in rodents indicate that energy yield from fat, independent of oral sensory stimulation, is sufficient to m- motivate intake. So, but this is rodents once again. Indeed, intragastric self-administration, meaning ingestion, um, infusion into the gastric system, not, not through the mouth. Uh, self-administration of uh, lipid emulsions mimics addictive type ingestive responses. These include increased licking rates during extinction or progressive ratio schedules of reinforcement, as well as attenuated striatal dopamine concentrations during extinction trials that increase again when fat exposure is returned to maintenance concentrations. Thus, just to conclude, sensory and metabolic cues enhance the appeal of high-fat foods, whether these properties also uniquely contribute to intake of fat and energy in excess of need is less clear. Common experience indicates fat is the least satiating of three macronutrients. That's based on... Now, I could make an argument, but then again, I would say I'm biased when it comes to fat. But uh, let's, let's roll with these guys. This raises questions about the homeostatic control of feeding generally, or if a system exists, when and how it has been disrupted. One view is that chronic consumption of high-fat diets results in decreased responsivity to satiety signals. Recent work hypothesizes this adaptation to an obesogenic environment is a hippocampal-dependent phenomena. A number of early animal studies revealed damage to hippocampus, an area within the mesolimbic or reward pathway involved in learning and memory as well as the regulation of eating behavior, results in dysregulation of food intake and obesity. Another mechanism holds that dietary fat may modify food intake through activation of mesolimbic dopamine reward pathway. So anyway, that's a tough one right there. <laughs> Tackle it, man. You got this. <laughs> ole, ole. <laughs> I'll try it out. Oh, man. Oleo. Le- I cannot do it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oleo tenolamide. <laughs> oleo, oleo tenolamide. Oleo tenolamide. Amide. Oleo. <laughs> Oleol tenol amide, or OEA. Anybody who's hearing this, please, I apologize for butchering and murdering and just basically obliterating this term. Anyway, OEA, a lipid produced in the small intestines purported to regulate feeding and body weight, promotes satiety and has been posited as a lipid messenger linking excess energy intake and dopamine efficiency. Consumption of high-fat diet leads to a significant reduction of this OEA synthesis, resulting in dopamine dysregulation. This is supported by evidence that administration of OEA in the abdominal cavity, like direct administration, is sufficient to restore dopamine release in high-fat-fed mice, and dopamine release is dependent on the PPAR alpha gastrointestinal brain axis now hold your horses and let's go back to what, what what exactly is this ppar alpha thing so ppar alpha is a protein that is a major regulator of fat metabolism and activates under low energy conditions including fasting and is necessary in the context of our uh, our whatever we're doing is necessary for ketogenesis uh, the gut brain axis how, on the other hand is simply a link between the central nervous system and the entric nervous system signals can go back and forth. Basically, it's a bidirectional system. Importantly, however, the fat specificity of these mechanisms is not established. The dopamine reward pathway is suppressed by excessive food intake, not simply 
foods high in fat. Hmm. So it's not just unique to the fat. So Mm -hmm. there you go. In contrast to an adaptation or injury explanation for a neural basis for high fat feeding, it has been posited that selected individuals may have heightened responses to heightened heightened responsiveness to the palatability of high fat foods, promoting intake in excess of energy intake. Indeed, addictive type eating responses to high fat foods have been described just as for high sugar foods. However, there is no consensus as to whether there is a sufficient evidence base for high fat food addiction. One of the defining symptoms in addiction is withdrawal from rewarding substances. Symptoms of withdrawal are associated with increased stress that results in relapse, increased seeking behavior for that reward, and this has been reported in mice with fat withdrawal. Once again, poor rodents. (laughs) Animals fed a high-fat diet for four weeks exhibit a significant elevation in Delta FOSB, which is a transcription factor protein in the brain induced by chronic exposure to drugs of abuse. Additionally, abrupt withdrawals from high-fat diet to a less palatable chow diet results in decreased concentration of active cap response element binding protein or CREB. All right, this is going to get a little complicated. Kreb is basically a protein, which we just said the camp response element binding protein. It is a protein that regulates gene expression in the dopaminergic neurons and is in the context of this topic, has a purported role in development of drug addiction, though not in the context of this topic. However, as a side note, it is... Its downregulation is also implicated in the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Its role is also associated with Huntington's disease. And as is, it has many functions in various organs in body, and it plays a critical role in survival. So it's a very important thing. So it's like, it's, it's a bit muddy over here too. Like, up is, should it be low? Should it be high? High is kind of good, but not good. It's kind of all over the place. The result of decreased active CREP concentrations, which we just talked about, is associated with a significant increase in arousal and anxiety-like behaviors. Both CREB and delta FOS B, both we talked about, other neuronal responses to dopamine signaling, leading to the reduction in the rewarding effects of a stimulus. Through a dietary reinstatement model, it was further observed that mice experiencing withdrawal were willing to endure an aversive environment to gain access to the highly preferred high-fat diet. The author speculated that acute withdrawal from a highly preferred high-fat diet may elevate the stress state and reduce reward which contributes to the drive for dietary relapse. Meaning that going back to that diet. So very interesting things getting pushed back and forth over here. So despite the similarities between food and drugs of abuse on reward centers, one clear distinction is that the magnitude of response to foods is a fraction of what is observed in drugs of abuse. So there's a difference. One study demonstrated that individuals develop a preference for fat during infancy. This, Corey, these are real. This is like, I was blown away by this part. This, these guys make a lot of sense. Let's, let's repeat through this. One study demonstrates that individuals develop a preference for fat during infancy. That was the hypothesis. Um, and this preference is thought to predispose an individual to consume predominantly high fat diet in adulthood. You know, like breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mice acutely exposed to a high-fat diet during early early life exhibited significant alterations in biomarkers of dopamine responses. Additionally, a 10-day macronutrient choice test mature adult mice showed a significant preference of a high-fat diet. But here's the clincher in all of this. You know, this whole predisposition of high fat earlier, you're going to prefer high fat stuff later. But here's the clincher here. Despite the increased proportional intake of high fat diet, there were no differences in total daily energy intake or fat gain or weight gain. All right. You have differences in fat preferences, Mm -hmm. but there's no change in daily energy intake or weight gain. 
In other words, preferences changed, but this had no impact on her gene tech. Also, also, very interestingly, breastfed human infants that are exposed to a high-fat diet, that is about 50% of their energy from fat, of human breast milk or formula, yet this association with no cor- has no correlation or has low incidence of overweight and obesity. I mean, this would mean that everybody's going to be obese when they're right. breastfed. Right. <laughs> so, once again, just because something happens in rodents doesn't mean that that is going to be A, related to energy intake, and B, it's going to translate into humans very well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so once again, interesting stuff. You have to be very careful about these kind of, oh, yeah, that makes so much sense. Nope, 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 nope. There's caveats. Thus, the translation of the rodent literature to humans must be made cautiously. Functional magnetic resonance neuroimaging, or fMRA, studies yield mixed findings on responses to fat. Some work suggests that there are individuals highly responsive to reward value of food linked to their metabolic status, while others reveal higher hypo or low responsiveness to food reward. So there's subjective differences as well that you have to factor in. Obese individuals subjectively rated high fat foods as being more pleasant than their lean counterparts, yet fMRI data suggests obese individuals show less activation in the dorsal striatum in response to consumption of palatable foods and reduced striatal D2 dopamine (laughs) receptor density. That's so strange. (laughs) Oh, man. Dorsal striatum is the brain region, basically, that mediates motor functions, uh, inhibitory control, impulsivity, and stimulus response learning. D2 dopamine uh, receptors, on the other hand, in the fore- are in the forebrain. Uh, they handle tasks like locomotion, attention, sleep, memory, and learning. Both are lowered in obese individuals, uh, at least associated with low levels in these individuals, in obese individuals, despite the rating of high-fat foods as being more pleasant and palatable compared to lean individuals crazy Mm -hmm. consistent with both the hyper and hyposensitivity theories it has been hypothesized that individuals who are predisposed to obesity may experience increased hedonic drive during the onset of fat gain the increased exposure and consumption of high fat foods down regulates the dopamine reward pathway leading to a reduction in the hedonic value of those foods. Once again, Mm -hmm. the value goes down. Mm -hmm. Can't eat that Twinkie again. (laughs) Oh, man. We talk about Twinkies so much, and we're all about the keto. Oh, it's just low-hanging fruit, and it's easy to talk about. We should talk about the low-hanging fruit. I would say, what are low-hanging fruits that you know of? Uh, Sweet summer peaches. All right, sweet summer peaches. We're going to switch the word Twinkies to sweet summer peaches now. (laughs) SSP for uh, the scientific definition. Yeah, (laughs) we should create our own energy pod, EP. (laughs) Chocolate fudge energy pod, (laughs) CFEP. Oh, man. We should totally do that just to sound more scientific. Oh, man. These three three, uh, podcasts were such a crazy doozer, man. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. So where were we, man? Support for this hypothesis is presently lacking in uh, humans. In summary, the rewarding properties of fat, both sensory and metabolic, have been associated with low satiety and weight gain. Post proposed mechanisms implicate low and high responsiveness to in uh, high responsiveness of individuals at both the neural and behavioral behavioral levels. Most importantly, none of it has to be as yet to be substantiated. None of it is substantiated, basically. <laughs> so there are theories, there's hypotheses, there's all of these things about fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, but guess what? There's evidence opposing that as well. Yeah, this is the fog of war. This is the fog of war. <laughs> we don't know what's beyond. You don't know where the mortars are coming from. No, we don't. That was a Company of Heroes reference. <laughs> God, we're going to turn everybody into a nerd. That's the that's the that's the real plan of Keto Geek. We're starting off as a food business, but we're going to turn everybody into a nerd. It's been the absolute true goal, and if you followed us from the beginning, you would understand completely. We actually have a uh, Thanos fist here. Yeah, that's our business plan. When we wrote our business plan, it was like the goal is to take every human being and turn them into nerds. It's the most top, most vision line. <laughs> and uh, we we don't have a 
We don't have a sort of like a statement like that. Oh, this is our aesthetic and take it or leave it. But nerd is uh, the best. Yeah. Our vision is just to make people healthier and happier, provide them sustainable foods and lead by example. That's what we do. Um, And our philosophy is ever so evolving over time. So all of this concludes our proteins, fats and carbohydrates series. And uh, we can go through the author's conclusions over here so that everything is just completed. Let's see what they have to say. Perspectives on the roles of macronutrients in appetite and energy intake have changed over time. Their digestion products and or circulating metabolites have been viewed as signals to initiate eating events, thus determining eating, eating frequency, signals to terminate ingestive events, thereby controlling portion size, and signals that activate brain reward systems that may, ha- may dysregulate healthful eating. Drawing on these views, a wide variety of diets have been proposed, accentuating or minimizing each macronutrient to achieve a desired effect on appetite and or energy intake. Con- common experience over the past six decades reveals none of it has been successful, which is kind of true. This is likely due to their failure to adequately address effects on eating frequency and portion size concurrently, as well as the fact that ingestive behavior is guided by many cognitive and environmental factors in addition to sensory appeal, appetite, and metabolic, endocrine, and neural signals stemming from macronutrient intake, digestion, and metabolism. Furthermore, overweight and obesity result from many inputs in addition to energy intake, thus weakening the predictive power of macronutrient distribution on this outcome. There may be health reasons to emphasize emphasize one macronutrient over another in a diet, like for example, the keto, the therapeutic effects, but from the perspective of energy balance, total energy intake rather than the source is its critical factor to address. And that wraps up this entire three-parter. Corey, this was, this was a mouthful. Many mouthfuls. Indeed. No pun intended. <laughs> well, I'm going to laugh anyway. <laughs> I have to say it was intense, uh, but this, uh, like I said earlier in this podcast, many gems were mined, many gems, and we're we're starting to see a sort of a pathway that we can begin to follow and piece together, and I really like what these papers are teasing out. Yes, some of the mechanisms and some of the things that we were told, and we thought at the start of the Keto Geek, and even during, like even if two years ago, we, we thought that these things were true, have been turned out to be not true at all. So this, is, this has been an evolutionary journey for Keto Geek and you guys as well who have stuck around. This was a powerful three-part, very powerful. And if you guys have taken some lessons into it, I know this was a little bit on the tough side to understand, but once you get it, oh man, a lot of this stuff is amazing material you don't have to know every single thing but take out those nuggets and observe them and perhaps in the future if you hear a certain term or a certain concept you can come back to this podcast redo it or go to that section pertaining to that topic and see what what the science says over here and so this was very very informative and this was me about two to two and a half years ago So this is not current stuff for me. Like this was the stuff that started resonating when I was doing the podcast and people were like, what happened to the Keto Geek podcast? Where where did it vanish? Why did you guys stop doing interviews? This is the reason why we stopped doing podcasts. When you get to hear these concepts and you read and research yourself and you see contradicting evidence, you're like, let's reevaluate the entire path. Let's see what's going on over here. So we took our time, sweet time, to reevaluate what our direction was. And now we have a much more informed opinion about this top, these topics. So if I were to sort of conclude over here, I wouldn't say none of, I would say none of the macronutrients are the clear winner over here. Food is a fabrication. It's a woven web of macronutrients, micronutrients, and even non-nutritive components. It's a process as well of extraction nutrients all the way from the moment that you look at food from its visual appearance and perhaps auditory. <laughs> I don't know if what food is auditory. I guess looking at the, hearing the ads with the beautiful music is kind of auditory. If you've ever uh, eaten uh, Rice Krispies, you'll know the auditory uh, component of cereal popping as you pour milk over it. That's kind of nice. Yeah, there is that. And even in market, like for example, when you go watch a movie, there's the, the Coke being poured. Oh, yes. To make you thirsty. 
Yep. Or go pee. Crunching a popcorn. Two, two, two things happens at that time. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So the food is a little bit more complicated. And in the last two years, what I've been doing, and I've been talking to Corey about this for a large period of time, is we've been... We've been focusing on another part of the world. We've been focusing on food science and food architecture, which seems to be a much more promising approach towards uh, health, food, and nutrition. And why do I say that? Is because you these the food architecture itself is what dictates the downstream consequences that are happening in your body, whether it's the brain, whether it's the endocrine system, whether it is the metabolic system involved over here. So that is the heart of the problem. And we're going to go into a bunch of researchers from New Zealand pretty soon who have extensively worked on food architecture. And then there is some work in our within our European buddies who have created some fantastic models when it comes to digestion and uh, uh, all the food stuff. And uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. But, you know, like we said, complications, you have to delve into them if you are going to find a solution over here. And I'm, pr- I'm proud to say, I'm happy to say maybe uh, that uh, I'm literally right now, Corey, and you probably, to a large extent, I'm at least on a 99% ultra processed or processed food diet for the last one, two years. No green vegetables, unless, you know, it's just uh, something with friends. And fruits, barely any. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I, I have to agree. I've been doing a, just about the same thing. Um, the greens come in during special times, and I eat a very simple meal per day, and I follow it, and it just it seems to work. And honestly, Fahad, I feel better than I have ever felt. I'm, I've turned 30 last year, and I've never felt healthier. Exactly. I'm noticing the same things. Now, these are all anecdotes. We've talked about science. Our anecdotes don't come as strongly as that. But the point here is that because you and I have a better understanding and we've talked a lot about food structure and architecture and a lot of these concepts, uh, and sometimes I've even posted and shown you certain diagrams, certain disintegration uh, food models and um, certain graphs and charts as well, you know what happens within our body with those foods. And uh, so I I do not fear food, period, at all. If anything, I kind of want to process the food some more to uh, extract more nutrient, more value from my meals. That's exactly how I'm thinking. Like the whole world is thinking processed food is bad, ultra processed is evil, anything in plastics is totally nonsense. Meanwhile, over here, I'm con- connecting all these dots, looking at the science, looking at how gastric emptying is working, looking at how th- certain structures modulate certain nutrient digestion in a certain way. And I realized I actually want my food to be quite a bit more processed. I know which foods have the tendency to make somebody obesogenic because they bypass your satiety signals. And then there are foods that are anorectic. Like, for example, I would argue that kale is, uh, has an anorectic behavior because it, there's literally no energy in it. And... Another interesting uh, epiphany that we've both had is we're not afraid of energy. We're not afraid of calories. Calories are necessary, man. Uh, Absolutely, absolutely. Um, And I noticed that the my own personal caloric uh, requirements uh, change uh, day in day out. If I'm, for example, uh, on a rest day, I feel like my caloric uh, needs are more in the neutral range, uh, more for what I'm going for, what I what I need for the basal metabolism rate, basically, uh, what my body needs to operate normally. When I'm working out, I crave more protein. I crave a little bit more energy, uh, perhaps even before, like a simple carbohydrate for some explosiveness. Yep. And another very interesting observation we've had in the last two years is we're eating the tastiest foods we can find. Literally the tastiest foods we can find. So when you're eating ultra processed or processed foods, you understand how the mechanisms of satiety and which foods have the tendency to create an obesogenic or anorectic uh, uh, outcome, you know which switches to toggle. Not only just intuitively, you have a mechanistic understanding of those concepts. So this is the end game. This is it. This is, the, this is where the story stops. <laughs> now the question is, how do you quantify this? Which is also something that we're going to talk about pretty soon. So this is, these are exciting times. This is very fantastic. There are literally models that we are aware of, even in their infancy, uh, from 
which you can deduce what is the disintegration rate of a certain food, how they are metabolized. Now, they're a little bit more complicated, like I said, but that's the holy grail, dude. If there are, if they, now this is, I'm going to say this with quite a bit of confidence here. If there is an end to obesity and diabetes and in conjunction with targeted nutrient delivery, targeted uh, dietary invent interventions, uh, um, emerging of the pharmaceutical and the food industry with the nutrition world, this is where it's at. The architecture of food. That is the heart of this whole thing. Because we know that even in the pharmaceutical worlds, the architecture of the food is what they've been using to do targeted drug deliveries, to disintegrate a certain drug at a certain uh, location or at a certain rate, or let's do a delivery half an hour late. They've taken all of this knowledge from guess what? Food. So guys, now you can start seeing the constellation shine up. You're, you're about to see that if it's not just one macronutrient driven approach, it's, it's a combination. After all, whether it's a steak, whether it's kale, whether it's chicken, whether it's a Twinkie, whether it's a cookie, these are not just one macronutrient. That's kind of like saying that uh, when you look at a plane, you say aluminum makes the plane fly. No, it's not the aluminum. There's plastics in the plane. There's engineering that's gone into it. There's glass on there. There's a lot of different alloys that are on there. There's the air conditioning system that is set up there. So a lot of... Is there air conditioning on the airplane? It's not necessary, per se, is it? Most likely not in fighter jet planes. I know this because they have to wear uh, warm suits, but in your commercial airliner jets that you ride to get from Houston to, uh, Houston to New York, perhaps. Um, yeah, those are going to be air-conditioned cabins with air-pressurized uh, cabins properly. So yes, that's not simply aluminum, though. It's not, no. Uh, we're looking at dynamics of how the uh, wind affects the foils of the wings yep and uh, then there's the wheels that are uh, using rubbers or rubber polymers exactly so fraction on the ground bingo so when somebody says now and you should be thinking as listeners yourself when you say here somebody says protein does xyz what they're referring to is not even protein you can now see that protein is a spectrum. What everybody's calling protein is a spectrum. It's a woven web containing fats, proteins, sugars, non-nutrients, nutrients, a lot of different things that are processed, extracted. There are ways to create the architecture. There are ways to disrupt the architecture. The vegans are, are at it with their vegan meat. Cell cultured meats are out there that are creating web architectural webs in the form of fake meats, whatever you want to call them. Um, you take eggs, you scramble them up. Now you've scrambled them or you can mix them up with meat. You've created a new architecture. So these are different architectures and structures of food that have a different impact. And based on the cooking, they may be denatured or may be resistant to digestion, which is which also happens with, for example, with steak. Is that when you cook it a little bit more, it is more resistant to digestion. When you used, uh, for example, your... Um, softeners or you smash them into smaller sizes that is faster rap digestion right and this also goes to explain even dr mattis whose paper we just went through now he's focusing some of the work that he's that is latest right now is focused on food architecture like the mastication of nuts or the chewing of nuts and breaking them down noticing how fat and proteins and fibers interact with each other to modulate nutrient delivery so this is exactly where we're going at now that is the heart of it even the studies on processed foods where are they converging they're converging straight to food architecture what's the difference between uh protein and fat from steak versus protein and fat drink drunk in isolation which is oil and uh, protein powder one is satiating whether uh, the other is not now merge them together to create a fabric or a web now you have totally different things that's so right. this is a beautiful time to be alive where now you can experiment with different foods. You can come up with different combinations. So ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's start a new aura or era of keto geek where we learn and experiment and create new foods and we create a better tomorrow. So two years have passed. We took a break. We learned a lot of things. Now, welcome to the new form of keto geek. It's amazing. And this is all born because we decided to drop those pearls that we clutched onto for the longest time. We decided to actively falsify ourselves in Keto Geek, and we encourage our listeners to also look for, like, look for what is true to you at that moment. And that makes sense, but then question it. Dive deeper. Try to tease out mechanisms. Like, have fun with it, even. 
Yeah. Now let's focus on cool things like what is cheese? What causes cheese to behave a certain way? What are carrots? What causes carrots to act a certain way? Uh, let's look at individual foods, how they are interwoven together with these different particles and nutrients and all these factors that are in place, how they interact with the GI tract. Let's, let's start from a really bottom-up approach, a simplistic approach, and then start getting into complicated meals, like, for example, carrot stew. So I think that is a far superior approach, perhaps a little bit more complicated, but it is more relevant to finding the solution to the problem than just lumping everything together and saying, oh, it is the fat or the protein or the carbohydrates. No, that's a very, very limiting or primitive approach. I think of it as a Neanderthal approach. <laughs> like, seriously, it, it has, I mean, it has its merits. Perhaps it worked for simplicity in some occasions, but nope, I'm not happy with it. I want to get into complexity. I want to find a solution. That's what I signed up for when I started Keto Geek. We want to find a solution. Now, here's the solution. Let's work towards it. So from now on, we are going to start focusing on these concepts, and we will do a podcast on food architecture. But for now, the next week, we have Danny Vega to take us, take us away from all the science and have a little bit of a wisdom, wisdom wise wisdom approach. He's a bit of a monk. Oh, yeah, I've heard he he's gained much uh, wisdom and much uh, much power over the past two years as well. Interesting. I'm very excited to have Danny back. Um, he was a bomb in the last podcast uh, with Mara and Danny. Now just one on one, Fahad and Dan uh, Danny. This is gonna be great. Yeah, what I would say is for the next podcast, I guess we can talk a little bit more about it when we actually have the podcast. Is that just chill out, relax, sit on a beach, forget about the world, and that is the podcast you should be listening to. So, Corey, I think we've knocked out two hours, nearly one and a half to two hours, close to two hours of our show. This was very awesome. Thank you for joining me on this ride and going through this insane waters of knowledge. Um, do you have anything to add over here before we do the final plugs? There's nothing more to add to this. Uh, I know you guys have been blasted with the fire hose and uh, we're about ready to wrap it up and let's go ahead and move into the plugs. So ladies and gentlemen, I am Fahad. I can be found on at, at FMAHMAD88 and Corey yourself. Can people find you or do you do want to remain un, 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 unfound? You can come find me at Instagram. I have the most annoying uh, Instagram handle ever. It has an underscore Corey, C-O-R-E-Y, A-N-D-E-R, Ander, Coriander. I know it's a really funny play on words, but come find me on Instagram. And I even have the Keto Alchemist uh, at on uh, Keto Geek as well, which needs a little bit more tweaking and a little bit more life in it, but you'll see that more to come. Exactly. And just to give the final plugs to our great writers of the paper that we used in the last three podcasts, Corey, I think you, you did a stellar job. I did it last week and I might have nuked their names. <laughs> So we have uh, a group of uh, wonderful people, wonderful minds to thank, and they're all who collaborated on this uh, paper along with Richard E. Mattis. And to begin, we have Alicia L. Carriero, Japna Dillon, Susanna Gordon, Ashley G. Jacobs, Kelly A. Higgins, Brianna M. MacArthur, Benjamin W. Raiden, Rebecca L. Rivera, Leigh R. Schmidt, and finally, Richard D. Mattis. Awesome. And the paper is called The Macronutrient Appetite and Energy Intake. You guys can check it out on the show notes. And meanwhile, while you're at it, guys, it means a lot to us. Please do the two things that we really want from you guys. Go buy our Energy Pod products or buy our Geek. Put it on subscription. It's so important. It really supports our work. Gets the word out of there. Tell your friends about it. Share, share it with them and tell them what the science is, what we do. The word of mouth has always been one of the best marketing tools since the dawn of time. Your words are so important. You guys are part of the family. We do all of this for you guys. Going to the end of the world, we could have taken the easy path, but we're going hardcore because we love you guys so much. We want to see you happy and become healthier. I know we have a lot of um, customers, a lot of women customer, by the way, just to give a side note. And when we look, when we think of it, it's like we want to give these ladies the best foods that we can make because you never know. These could be our future mothers, our future wives, our future sisters, future daughters, or whoever it is. It's it's amazing. And we we only think of the best of you. Every day we wake up and we do our work. We're always thinking about how can we 
give you guys the best we have. So go buy our products. It means a lot. Share it with your family. Make it a staple at your home if you can. Give us feedback so we can also improve the product as well. So it's always going to be a two-way street. Now, the second way you could do it is actually give this podcast a rating or a review. It takes only one second. And the ratings, uh, just spread the word like wildfire. People get exposed to better knowledge, better information. And um, it, it helps them just pass the light forward. So two things. One, buy our product, subscribe to it. And two, ratings. Whether it's the podcast or our product, give those ratings. And that's what you can do. And thank you so much for listening to the podcast. You guys rock. Thank you for listening to the show. You can visit us at KetoGeek.com to check out our premium keto-friendly and low-carb food products, including our infamous energy pods made from the best ingredients we could find in the entire country. We also recommend signing up for our newsletter at ketogeek.com slash sign up, where you get exclusive discounts, rewards, product announcements, and the latest content we are working on. You also get a 10% discount on your entire order when you sign up. Go to ketogeek.com slash sign up to join the low-carb playground. <laughs>